So, uh, the purpose of this lecture series was to help build an intellectual community. I'm a little bit here at Rasir, and I'm just delighted that there is such a great attendance at this, our second speaker of the series. And um, and I think it also speaks to the importance of RSVPing, so you don't understand. <laughs> So uh, I'm very pleased to welcome David Kirk today. David Kirk is the James Dean Harbor Professor of Public Policy at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley, where he's been a professor since 1971. Uh, David is I was eight years old. <laughs> he is the author of 17 books. His most recent book, and the one on the chalkboard there, is Improbable Scholars, the Rebirth of the Great American School System and a Strategy for America's Schools. It was the 2013 Outstanding Book of the Year from ADRA. He is also the editor of a recent op-ed in the New York Times and many other op-eds and, uh, and newspapers all around the country. That op-ed was titled, Teaching is Not a Business. It was the top story on that site over a weekend in August, and it absolutely blew up my Twitter feed. And um, he- Good or bad? We'll discuss it one. <laughs> And, um, and in addition to lecturing all over the world, uh, in many uh, envious, enviable places, Melbourne, Oslo, Wellington, he was also a member of President Obama's transition team in 2008. So uh, we're delighted to have him here. Thank you. So I do want to begin where, where Morgan uh, referenced that piece that appeared in the New York Times, which I thought was going to be as anodyne as harmless a piece as I could imagine writing when I'm talking about why it is that human connections are essential in education. You can't, you know, work your way, you can't create teacher for the curriculum, you can't, you know, technology is the answer to the universe, you're not going to, you know, market incentives aren't going to do it. And it was interesting, this, as Morgan said, it was the most widely emailed piece of the day. It was the seventh most widely emailed piece in August. Um, and the same thing was true when I did a kind of preview of coming attractions uh, piece in the Times, um, my favorite email of all time, because that it was it was the number one email piece on the day that the Pope announced his resignation. So my favorite email, four words: "You beat the Pope." <laughs> <laughs> and and as 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 that little colloquy that you just heard um, indicates. Um, this is controversial stuff, and in a, in a very one very depressing way, that I got about 400 emails. The Times left its, its comment section open for a very short period of time. Um, and if you read my emails in those comments, generally they're overwhelmingly positive. If you look at the blogosphere and the Twitter sphere, you have the folks in the two camps talking to themselves. So, and then I get, and then you know you have people doing crazy things in this field. Um, a, um, God, I got a blank on its name. Um, <laughs> spinning wheel. It's Rick Hess. Yeah, Rick. So Rick Hess, who is my my honest conservative, Rick Hess, who's sitting on the back of this book cover, sends out a tweet that begins, "Kirk makes big bucks with nonsense pablum about." And I, my, my note to him was, you know, I'll trade, you know, incomes with you anytime. I'm making big, by the way, sure, I'm making big bucks being here today, so <laughs> supporting that. Um, and what the hell? I mean, what are you doing, Rick? You know, what happened? There? This is, what's, you know, Fox TV taking over your brain. Um, so I became, I became a part of this. This, uh, I would, I don't know if conversation is the right word, this sort of hand-to-hand um, you know, -hand combat around the future of um, K-12 education um, <clears throat> with this book. Um, and I'll get to it in a bit. Um, it focuses on a city just outside of New York, Union City, New Jersey, population 85,000. Um, it is an overwhelmingly immigrant, overwhelmingly poor, Latino immigrants school district. Um, the most crowded city in America, which doesn't mean a lot of skyscrapers. Um, it means you've got three, four, five families packed into an apartment, family of four or five in one bedroom, locked door, shelf in the refrigerator. Um, these are poor immigrants, um, often essentially uneducated immigrants. You can grab the door, maybe. 
Exactly the kind of students who most school districts give up on. Um, and what made Union City worth paying attention to was the fact that it had a graduation rate of 90%. National average graduation rate now has crept up to about 80%. And about 75% of those students um, went on to enroll in college. Um, and rumor has it that this is a good read, so um, to a lot more, a lot more about this. And, and the book became controversial because it didn't fit the agenda of the folks who have adopted the label of reformer. Um, it's and when I finished writing this book, and I spent a year in Union City trying to figure out what had happened. There. Why is this place so amazing? I, I just it dawned on me that. You know that special ed kids are entitled to receive an individual education program, an IEP? Well, in effect, Union City gives IEPs to all of its students. It doesn't call them that. It's not a formal process. But they are paying, they are not batch processing students. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that down the road. That's, that's amazing to imagine a district doing that. It's amazing that at an elementary school where I spent a fair amount of time with 800 students, the teacher could do what she called party planning in May. She devoted the month to figuring out which kids would go with which teachers in the next year. So you know that some kids need a kick in the pants, some kids need a hug, some kids really work well together, others should never be in the same room. You're trying to match kids with, that's, a, that's extraordinary. Right? It also makes it hard to think about value-added test scores because you're going to have very different kinds of kids in those places. Um, so, in the book I wrote before this, um, called Kids First, I said, here's the golden, the policy golden rule. The policy <coughs> golden rule is every child deserves what you would want for a child that you love. Um, not necessarily as fancy with all the bells and whistles, but all the basic systems of support. And I thought that today, instead of giving my standard sort of version of this book and lecture, I would step back and look at the, con the, the issues in terms of this theme about the power of personal connections, the IEP for all kids. So the reformers model, let me suggest to you the importance of framing issues. Right? First, the ye who get the mantle of reformer, reformer is not a neutral term. Right? So it sounds like a positive ethic. Um, so on whatever issue you're working in, uh, very important in policy and politics to figure out a way to define it that, that gains some currency. Well, this is the reformers. And basically, they look to business to solve the problems of a broken system. So whether it's markets and competition on the one side, or the more fancy current version, Clay Christensen, the Harvard Business School professor, uh, talking about disruptive innovation, that's what education needs, the argument goes. So if you think about the test results and the high stakes reading and math test as the equivalent of the bottom line of the company. Um, companies shut stores that aren't doing well, and they open stores in more promising territories. The um, reformers um, shut low performing schools and um, open uh, new turnaround model schools and the theory that it will accomplish the same thing. Um, technology is another one of these sort of key factors in this story. And Clay Christensen, who is a really a very interesting guy and a very smart guy, um, um, comes to various fields outside of the business world and he writes this book called Disrupting Education and says that by 2020, half of all elementary school kids will be, uh, will be learning everything online. Um, and um, he has since moderated that point, and I think that's important as a, as a segue. I mean, now he says, for a whole bunch of reasons, that K-12, a large K-12 institution is not going to be changed in that way. You're going to find technology blended with other forms of learning, which is true and is smart. And I realize the word technology in this town is a loaded term, um, right? Any iPads to be seen amongst you? Um, 
but I think I, I think that what Christensen did was to sort of move back from a kind of a tourist view of what education was going to be like into trying to integrate the, the new with the old, trying to engage in um, what is called um, in another part of the business world continuous improvement. So here's what's wrong with the business model. It doesn't work. This version of the business model doesn't work. Um, if you fire, if you, if you put teachers' jobs on the line, you fire them, they're not doing, not beating the competition. And basically you set up a regime that, underline, that undermines the morale of teachers, and it may very well discourage people who are thinking about teaching to go into the field. If it's that fraught with uncertainty. And given the arguments about the metrics that are used to make these high stakes decisions, you know, it, it just adds an element of uncertainty. Um, merit pay for an individual teacher has the effect of increasing competition and reducing collaboration. Because what you want is that teachers in third grade, who I talk about in this book, working together to do something better than any one of them can do. If, I, if somebody asked me what, what unit I would think about, I was, if I was going to reward anybody in a school, who would it be? It would be ideally the whole school, but certainly the grade. Because then you got, then you really are encouraging the sort of behavior that you want to encourage. Um, there is no evidence that closing schools because of low test scores results in better schools, even though there's a whole new cadre of folks who come in. Um, charter schools are the, the the competition model in the broader market. The best ones are fantastic. The worst ones are utter disasters. Um, Online have a look at the online charter schools and the data which suggests that, that kids who started out ahead of their peers and who go to an online charter school lose a fair amount of ground. Um, that, hasn't, that has not kept a number of states from welcoming them with, with open arms. But overall, um, the data doesn't suggest that charter schools are the answer, that they're going to do better than public schools. And vouchers, the same thing is, is true. Um, you know, you can point to examples, you know, New Orleans is an interestingly complicated case in which you had a public school system so broken and you had so much money pouring in and so much sympathy pouring in and you lost half the students. You didn't have a school board or a union to deal with. In that world, it may very well be that what happened is, it is the case that what happened is better than, than what existed before. But New Orleans is not, for all those reasons, is not the universe. Um, I mean, it's just a, it's a simple fact that even if you take the really good charter school systems, the learning, the charter school systems that are learning, um, and in this new book, How to Teach, it's a lovely conversation about the learning that went on inside the, you know, the best of the charter schools movements, as to how you combine teaching character and teaching academics. Um, they're not going to begin to reach 62 million kids. There isn't the bandwidth to make that happen. And so, David Brooks, writing in yesterday's New York Times, bemoaning the fact that the World Health Organization isn't really set up to respond to a problem like the Ebola problem, and that we're not really, that, that nations aren't prepared with integrated structures to respond to something like ISIS. That you have to keep doing this every time, says, what we need is big, stolid agencies, the bulwarks of civil order, public management matters. Well, if the, my way of, take a, of, of borrowing that line is just to say that public schools are the structure that are going to educate the lion's share of kids. So you can either sort of forget about them or demonize them or do what you can to make them better. Um, the, guts of an education program connects a talented teacher, an engaged student, and a challenging curriculum. And you can add lots of things around that, but that's the, that's the guts of what's going on inside the education apparatus. If you read the reformers, you don't find any discussion of teaching and learning, you find a discussion about competition in markets. My buddy Rick Hanushek up at 
the Hoover Institution, and very, very influential in, in, this, in this field, basically describes teaching as a black box and says, I have no idea how you do it, but I do know that teachers are going to respond to incentives, like everybody else. Um, that's the nature of the, of the, of the disagreement. I don't think so. I don't think there's a way of avoiding the inherently messy business of building relationships based on trust as the foundation for any education. Okay. So I, I don't want to sound like I'm an anti-business guy, because I'm not. Um, I just think that the um, critics of the system have picked the wrong business models to look at. So back in the 1960s and 1970s, a guy named W. Edwards Deming had an idea for how to, how to improve American industry. Industry wasn't interested. He goes to Japan. He is widely credited as being the architect of a Japanese miracle. He comes back to the United States. He becomes the guru of the Fortune 500 company. What does he talk about? The mantra, improve constantly and forever the system of production and service. Plan, do, check, act. That's the model. So this is where, for example, on the assembly line, you engage the people who are on that line with much more responsibility, and they get to decide when to halt the production of cars, rather than <coughs> operate where they're just doing little bits and pieces along the way. Plan, do, check, act. If any of you are in the preschool field, this should sound vaguely familiar. High Scopes curriculum, which is the curriculum used in the Perry Preschool, is plan, do, review. So if it works for three and four year olds, and it works for businesses and other large organizations, it ought to work in schools. Um, meanwhile, about the same time, a Pulitzer Prize winning historian at the Harvard Business School, and Alfred Chandler, studied firms over a period of 60 and 70 years. And he found that those that prospered over the long run had developed what he called organizational capabilities, putting effective systems in place and encouraging learning inside the institution. So this is where you get the kind of vulgarization of a learning organization. And one of the points that Chandler makes is this takes a long time. You don't just change cultures. Hi, I'm the new culture, you know, follow me. Um, and it's very easy to upend that culture. If someone, some, some bright-eyed bright executive decides, you know, she's going to reach for this newest, latest, hot idea that's out there in the world. Same thing to, to come closer to the present. You read the stories of how Ford Motor Company, which was deeply, deeply in the hole, 2007 becomes the most successful car company, you find that they bring in a CEO who does two things. He simplifies the product line. This is what we do. And we're not going to change what we're doing every other day because we think that's the kind of car people want. No, that's the kind of car people want. We're going to build what we think is going to work. And we're going to, we're going to establish a culture of cooperation by a mechanism that's sort of like what I suggested about teachers. You know, in the past, the culture had been cutthroat competition. I get a bonus because of what my division does. I'm going to undercut those guys because I want to be much better than they are. He establishes as the, the metric for pay how the company does. So all of a sudden, everybody's got an interest in how everybody else is perceived. Every education and youth serving <coughs> organization that I know anything about has at its core the need to strengthen personal bonds, to bake that kind of individual connection into the organization. So preschools, intimate worlds, where you have kids working, exploring, and you have the teacher, the adult, hanging out, spending time, leaving the kids on their own. But there's always an adult around to help guide that exploration. Success for All is a reading uh, and math program, which has been an elementary school program, um, which has shown more success over a long period of time in boosting test scores in 
the toughest school districts and the toughest schools in those school districts in the country. It's been around since the early 1990s. In the land of education, that is, you know, the age of the brontosaurus. Uh, and they've survived, they've survived. And one of the keys to what they do is that the students keep the same teachers. The teachers follow the students. So that means that the kids have a number of adults who know them well, and the adults know the kids well. There's a new program called Diplomas Now. Um, interestingly, both of these programs developed at uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, seems to be a hotbed of new ideas, and that program began when a guy named Bob Balfant noticed something really simple. You could figure out by sixth grade who was going to be in trouble, and you could look at the kind of variables that it doesn't take a genius to figure out. Discipline, low grades, absenteeism. That's it. Almost a perfect correlation to school failure. The problem is nobody was really doing that in a systematic way. So you, you connect that with a set of supports for the kids in those schools in general, what I call love bombing those kids with um, the, the, um, the urban core folks who are hanging out, they're kind of their best older buddy, and for, and for students whose problems are more serious, the teacher and the staff figure out what that kid needs individually. Um, it's a famous study of the Chicago Public Schools, one of the best quantitative analyses that I know of, of what makes for success and failure. And that book looks at, identifies 100 schools that did better than the demography of the school would have predicted, and 100 schools that did worse than what the demography of the school predicted. And what you find is, as they say in that description, you find the establishment and the maintenance of trust-based relationships as a very important variable. Big brothers, big sisters. Biggest mentoring organization in the country and one that is given to doing a lot of evaluation. And one of the things they figured out is, so the big brother, you don't know about this world, right? The big brother who's any of you and the little go off and do stuff for, for you know, they meet once a week. Um, the organization is good at working to keep those relationships going. They have an 18-month goal at this point for what those relationships are about. Why? Because what the study showed, what the research showed is what the big and the little did together didn't matter. What mattered was the relationship. So you could find people, you could find these mentors and kids behaving in all sorts of different activities, but what was going on, the kind of trust that existed was there. Um, youth build. So youth build, I'm looking at organizations that I tracked down last year and trying to advise a foundation on how if it cared about kids, what kind of programs had a long track record, an evidence-based track record, and a capacity to grow and expand. Not the little projects here or there. And whatever youth build takes high school dropouts, about a third of them um, uh, have a child, about a third of them have been in prison or jail. This is the population on which schools have given up. 71% of the kids in youth build graduate high school. And the program combines academics, getting these kids prepared to the exam, and some kind of meaningful work, whether it is building houses where it started, or something in the medical field, or something in the tech field, that's the combination. And, and I was at Youth Build, as it happened, on the day after the graduation from what they call boot camp, first 30 days. And these are kids who not only might you hesitate, look twice at these kids if you were walking down a dark street, they would hesitate looking at each other in terms of you know, which, posse, which gang do you belong to. They were, you know, a teacher's dream. They were bubbling over with enthusiasm. And so I asked a bunch of them individually, you know, why, what, what's happening here? And the reaction was the same. In high school, big high schools, the teachers didn't care about us. We were just, you know, just wash us through. 
here they have your back. So that was, that's my fancy research way of, of signaling what I think is really crucial because every place I go I find it. There's a, a program developed at City University of New York, developed for community colleges, now being expanded to the four-year schools. Um, it has doubled the graduation rate. So as you may know, the graduation rate at community colleges, the four-year graduation rate, is about 32%. That was what it was at City University. It's now 64%. Um, and that program has been expanded at the state of Ohio and a number of individual community school districts. If you read the research that they have done, and you, you listen to what the students are saying, the monetary support they get matters, of course, at the margin. And one of the very smart things that this CUNY program did was to actually ask the students, you know, what's, you know, what are the factors that are making it hard for you to stay here? So one of them, which I don't think anybody else has paid attention to, is the price of textbooks. Do you have any idea how much an average student spends on textbooks a year? Any guesses? 800 bucks. Anybody else? Thousand. Thousand. Got it. Thousand dollars. You guys, yes, this is a this is a number that you definitely know. Um, I put all my materials online just to let you know. So it costs you nothing. Um, so they loan them textbooks. They give them um, subway passes because you know riding the subway turns out to be an expensive thing to do. They block schedule the kids so that they can plan work, home, school together. They encourage the students to take full-time course loads, if possible, because those are the kids who are likely to graduate. But what the students say really mattered most were the small groups that they had with counselors and the individual one-on-one -on -one bi weekly session. And it's that same, I have, they have my back. They care about me. I can talk about stuff. There's somebody who is interested in me. Now, to get a real sense of this, take a field trip to Cal State LA and try to imagine yourself as a student there and try to figure out what it would take to enroll for the next semester. What's involved? Give yourself a more gut-driven feeling of this. I did this up, up at, at uh, Cal State East Bay. I, I was bewildered. I can't imagine what um, the folks who show up at undergraduates go through. So this takes me to Union City. And I want to speak briefly about Union City because um, I wanted to leave a lot of time for your questions. So, I spent a year there. I had, in effect, a passport to go any place I wanted. So I was Mr. David in a class of third grade immigrant kids who were learning English while they were prepping for the first test. I spent time in that school, which is one of the poorest elementary schools in a poor town. In other schools, I sort of followed kids up to track who, you know, they would go to middle school, they go to middle school and high school and <clears throat> like so. Um, hung out with the, the superintendent and the top administrators, wandered into the mayor's office. The mayor is, the mayor really is some combination of Mother Teresa and boss Richard Daly. Uh, <laughs> guy is, the only sort of question about him is whether he's going to, how long he's going to live. And he's been a very important player in this particular story. But, and I'm happy to go into the particulars, but the general point about Union City is they develop over time a system of supports from preschool to high school. And everything that they have done is non-controversial. Everything they have done has been known for a generation or more to work. There isn't an educator out there in the world with a pulse who doesn't know this stuff. So why isn't everybody doing it? Because it's hard. And it's hard to keep doing it. Um, part of what's hard is building a culture in the school system that combines what I was calling culture of abrazos, culture of hugs, embraces, um, with a culture of respeto, respect, and high expectations. And you see that in a host of relationships across the institution. People are not afraid to speak their mind in this system. My favorite moment, I wanted to, to capture what that meant. I was sitting in 
an eighth grade math class. And the teacher, who's a nice, middle-aged, not particularly stylish woman, you know, was basic, was, you know, was doing a lot of this. Um, and the kids were totally into it. And it had nothing to do with me. I mean, trust me, you go, you go hang out in middle schools, the presence of an outsider is not exactly an incitement to peace. Uh, so afterwards, I, I, I said to her, this is amazing. You know, I, this is, it's amazing to see these kids so engaged. And she said, let me tell you a story. Last week, a new kid came in from another school district. And he was whispering under his breath, making fun of me to other kids in the group while I was teaching. And the other kids told him to shut up. And so after class, this group of kids that sort of disciplined the newcomer went up to her and said, Ms. Jones, we have your back. Okay, 13 years old, 14 years old, remember who these kids are? I doubt that I would ever have said, you know, we have your back to any of my teachers as an eighth grade kid. Um, people came, once this book was published, people came from all over the place to the school district saying, Okay, tell us about the way you do bilingual ed. We'll do that. Tell us about the way in which you have built a school system out of a system of schools using a set of organizational meetings between superintendents and principals. Where have you been? Where are you now? Where are you going? Meetings. You know, let's use your, you do a lot of testing. Let's see if we can't borrow your tests. Um, but that isn't what was going on. That's Imagining that you're a magpie and you found a shiny object, and that's the answer. The answer is putting it together in a thoughtful way and continuing to change. So the weakest part of that system was, historically, the high school generally. And the kids who came from Dominican Republic or Mexico or Guatemala or Ecuador, they showed up as 13, 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds. They had a piece of paper that said, I've got an eighth grade education. They had bought that piece of paper for 10 bucks. Um, from a principal in the school that had maybe a third grade education. The school had four years, the school system had four years to <clears throat> make them fluent in their home language, fluent Spanish, in English. So they had to learn Spanish, they had to learn English, and they had to learn American. And they had to learn all those subjects. They had to catch up. So they graduated. <coughs> The estimate was that of that group, that's where many, many of the dropouts come from, they graduated about 50% of those kids. Well, you know, that, I don't know what that sounds like to you, but it's a higher graduation rate than Syracuse, New York, Cleveland, New York. I haven't looked at it. Cleveland, Ohio, a lot of places. 50% of these kids graduate. And last year, three of the top 20 students had come to the U.S. less than five years earlier, knowing no English. And Another thing that's quite intriguing is they didn't just lock them in rooms. This is not like a, a <coughs> Korean education system applied there. These students were actively engaged in a host of school activities. A lot of, interestingly, in the, the young business person activities, they sort of, this is America, the place where you can, you can make it. Athletic teams, what have you. They were part of the culture of that place. They developed a whole new education program for these kids. Um, again, grouping them individually, figuring out who was where in what subject. We do the same thing in special education. I mean, the classic approach to special education is sort of like airline pricing policy. You put the kids, you get the regular classes sorted out, then you figure out where the seats are for the kids in the classes that are going to be mixed classes. Union City's high school starts with the special needs kids, figures out what mix of separate classes, classes with a tutor or aide in the class, and classes where the students are on their own. What mix works for each of these kids? That's the starting point. And they build everything else around that. So I just want to end by saying that this is not dramatic or flashy. Right? This isn't disruptive anything. It takes a long time to do. It takes stability in school systems. And it's not just a Union City story. I looked at districts that were bigger and littler, Latino, African-American, some combination of African-American, Latino, and poor white, unionized, non-unionized, elected school boards, appointed school boards. I was trying to find any evidence of districts that had done better on the achievement test, which is the metric that I had available to me. Um, 
better than the demography would have suggested. And then I, I had no idea what I would find. And what I found was quite consistent with what the Union City schools were doing. They weren't doing exactly the same program. The curriculum might have been different. The ways in which they supported teachers may have been different. The ways in which they connected the schools to the central office might have been different. They were all about systems of support, as much preschool as they could afford. You know, if you're in Montgomery County, Maryland, you got a ton of money. You can afford everything for everybody. If you're in Aldean, Texas, which is Houston's poor cousin, bigger than Washington, D.C., bigger than Boston as a district, and you've got $7,800 to spend. You know, these folks would look longingly on California. Um, what can they do? They can provide you know, early education for the neediest four-year-olds in that district, and that's Harlem. But that they recognize the importance of starting early. They have to make difficult, difficult trade-offs. Do we get the graduation rate up? Do we push our efforts to get kids through high school, or do we have advanced placement classes? We can't afford to do both. It's a horrible set of choices. But all of those places, and right down the road here, Gardena, Long Beach, successful school districts, one of the things that all of them have in common is that they're <coughs> stable places. You know, if I'm talking about building human relationships and connections, this really is about developing trust relationships within a community and realizing how hard it is to make a school system work. And that's, to me, the ultimate challenge. This way of thinking about public education takes time. It's not clear to me that people are willing to take that time. Thank you. So we have, what, 20 minutes or so. Questions, comments? So we were, we were talking a little bit before about this. So we, a lot of us in the room study Los Angeles Unified. And I've studied New York City, and I've studied places in Florida that are much larger. So, and I know you know that it's not an issue of size, and you give the Montgomery County example. But I wonder, what are the implications of what you've learned for some of these larger systems that really aren't, and don't have the capacity, they have the politics, and they don't have the stability? Well, What's to be done? So, just, to, just sort of little recapitulating the conversation that we had. I was in New York City and I was sharing a stage with Carmen Farina, who's the new school's chancellor. Lifer in education, smart person, wrote a really excellent book on school administration that nobody's ever heard of. Um, truly, and I read it because I was gonna appear in this conversation with her and somebody said, Carmen wrote a book, and I thought, oh. Um, <laughs> and it's really, it's really spurred. Um, and we spend, you know, an hour in, this conversation and I said somebody in the audience it's New York so somebody in the audience says so what's in it for us um, and I and I said I I would have thought I have thought that New York Chicago Los Angeles are districts that are too big to succeed you can't do it and if anybody can do it in New York it's gonna be Carmen Farina um, we were I was talking with Bill about um, the way in which the police force you know, was reassembled here under uh, Commissioner Bratton, uh, Police Chief Bratton. Well, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know enough about Los Angeles to say anything in particular, but I do know that although police departments are tough, it's a whole lot easier to remake a police department than it is to remake a school system because the tasks are different and I, I would say it's, it's more complicated to figure out how you educate a group of children in a building over some period of time, which changes you know, constantly as opposed to how you mix the kinds of control relationships with community building relationships that the police department has to do. So that's, I don't think I have anything to say <laughs> to, to Los Angeles or Chicago or, I mean, if people, you know, so I, I really would turn the question around and ask, so people who have studied but Chicago, let's just take Chicago right now. So Rahm Emanuel seems to be that he, he gets up in the morning and says, I want a new CEO for the schools, and he fires the one who's there, and he brings in a new one. I think there have been three or four, four I think now, in the four years that he has been, the almost four years that he's been the mayor of that city. I don't care if you won one of those MacArthur Genius Awards that were announced today. You're not going to be able to do it. This is where the stability point comes in. 
I don't, I don't, I don't know. What, what's to be learned from this on a, on a macro, on a macro scale with so many layers and so much entrenched dysfunctionalism and the like? I know the charter schools aren't the answer. You can't, you just can't open enough charter schools to educate all the kids in Chicago or Los Angeles. Um, and that was certainly not the answer. So, that's mine. I'm puzzled, and if anybody has any thoughts about this, you guys who've been working here, I, I'd love to hear them. Yes? I think I have a similarly perplexing question, but, um, so I really appreciate the attention to just the relational dimensions of teaching and the importance of that, and I think in teacher education programs that are preparing teachers specifically for urban context, there's a lot of attention paid to that, you know, drawing on just social psychology and the connections between emotion and cognition and all the work on the politics of caring and multicultural education and things like that. Um, but then when teachers actually get out there, even if they're you know, able to do those kinds of things in their own classrooms, they're part of systems that make it really challenging for them to engage in that work on a consistent basis, but also um, it's really difficult for them to sustain it over time because of just the toll that it takes on them to be able to do it in the really restrictive context that they're working in. So then there's stability, instability at that level too because they can't really keep it up over the long haul. So I'm just curious kind of what your thoughts are on that. And um, I mean, I, I think have the answer. Great. <laughs> right. Uh, if you're a teacher in a school in which the, you have a school leader who's the principal, if the principal is not and I'm on board with it, we've got to reach out to parents, and we've got to understand the dimensions of learning, and we've got to figure out how do you deal with discipline and deal with autonomy issues, and along the way, it'd be kind of nice if you taught something, you know, things substantive as well. If you don't have, a, within that school, you know, conceivably a group of teachers, but it's very hard to do without a leader, I don't have an answer. In fact, I have a tougher question, tougher questions for you. I was doing some work in East Oakland, just sort of Work meaning helping, you know, listening and commenting. So here's one elementary school, and I, I t you know, I'm asked, what would you do? And I said, well, I'd start by figuring out who the best teachers were and have them mentoring those who weren't doing so well. And the woman who I was with, who's great, and not somebody who's going to badmouth schools at all, said, what happens if you've got a school which there are only mediocre teachers? And one teacher, the one teacher who could be great, has glommed onto a call and response method of teaching, which works through third grade. You can watch this. It's a little bit like watching the training of a parrot. <laughs> I mean, really, it is, it, it really is like that. I don't, you know, uh, and that's not my image. That's actually the image of some, of some teachers. So I was reeling from that because that was new news to me when I discovered that the last week, two of the boys walking to school had been mugged uh, they were wearing gold crucifixes, which were grabbed from their necks. And I said, I'm done here, unless you figure out that level of, you know, basicness, right? You've got, this has got to be a harbor of safety more than anything else. And I could think about ways as to how you could make those safer trips than they are now. There's really nothing, nothing to be done. The, the problem with many reform ideas is that they work best in places that have the pre-existing organizational capacity to build reforms. But Long Beach, you guys know Long Beach and Gardena much better than I do, but as of last count, these are not, you know, the, the these are, this isn't Beverly Hills moved, you know, west and south, um, east and south. This is, you know, these are, these are districts that elsewhere, comparable districts are not doing well. One of the secrets in both of those places is that the administration has been stable for a long period of time. This doesn't begin. You know, this is not a forever story. You look, 25 years ago, Union City schools were so bad that the state of New Jersey said, we're going to take your schools over if you don't shape up. And they gave them a year to show some progress. And they sat over the shoulders of everybody who was there. Um, and that was a very important, that was a crucial wake-up call, right? This is the, you're absolutely under the gun to do something something better. And this, that's a very dramatic force of change. But what has happened in the districts that I know of that have done well is that some situation has gotten so out of control that there's enough leadership in the 
community, school and outside school, say, we have to do better than this. The employers in Aldine, Texas, 1996, come to the superintendent and says, this is impossible. We can't hire your kid, your graduates. They don't know how to read. They don't know how to do math. That's a crisis. Um, in Sanger, California, farm town, just outside of Fresno, teacher union relations with the school system were so bad that there was a billboard outside of town put up by the teachers union saying, respect the teachers, don't <coughs> stop here. Sanger, unfair to teachers. That takes a, that takes a level of animus, real level of animus. Um, you won't find that now, but you, that change didn't happen over the course of a year or two years or three years. Bring in a superintendent who begins to build back that trust, makes some mistakes along the way, learns, carries on. A very different story, both in terms of the, the structure of that system and the outcomes. Sanger is small, by comparison, Gardena and Long Beach, small places. And, even, and within a school, unless there's a group that can work together, on implementing change. Almost impossible. If you're, a, if you're a teacher in a classroom and you've got a kid who really cannot be contained in that classroom, and you can think of the things that a kid could do that would mean this kid has got to go elsewhere. And so this is the kid that you send to the principal's office, the principal's office sends them right back to you. Okay, what do I do? Right now I teach you what do I do in this, in this situation. Um, for better or worse, no there is no one uniform model of reform that's going to work in America. You know, we are not France. Totally centralized system. The old joke is, you look at your watch, it's a quarter to one. Every fifth grader in across the land is reading Racine. You know, we are definitely not that. But there are a lot of places that under the radar are doing the kinds of things that Union City is doing. Um, poor middle class places and middle class places. I know that because I get a bunch of phone calls from folks who say, I think we're kind of doing this. We'd love to hear you know, more from you as to what you, what you think about us. So if the lens is Los Angeles, you know, or it's just, or Chicago, it's, it's tough you know, to imagine how it is that you can change things. And my advice to that teacher would be any choice at all to find yourself in a school where there were you know, some like-minded folks there. On your own, on your own, yeah. I don't think Jaime Escalante could have done Yeah. Yes. So thank you for this talk. It's really inspiring. I'm curious about parents' involvement, because in, in uh -huh. Latin America, the parents care a lot about education, but the expectation is that you don't get involved in education. So yep. how this Exactly. Way? I mean, that's, you know, the parents will say, venerate La Profesora, she can be a first grade teacher, but she's La Profesora, and you hand the kid over to be educated. And you don't get engaged in the school, that's their business. So I asked before I went to spend time there, that question, and I said, okay, there's a parents meeting coming up in three or four weeks after school begins. What percentage of the, of the kids do you think are gonna have parents of that, or somebody, parent, guardian, grand, whatever. And they said, Oh, between 75% and 90%, and I thought, oh, please, this is not possible. And on the day of the meeting, the rain was pouring down. You could actually, you know, it was bucketing down. That auditorium was jam-packed. I mean, my best guess is that 90% was the right answer, that somebody was there. The principal begins the meeting by saying, is there anybody in the room who doesn't speak Spanish? Just give you a feel for where you are, right? <laughs> About five people didn't speak Spanish, so the meeting was conducted in both Spanish and English. The principal got a big hand. She's a very warm, caring, smart woman. The woman who is the head of the parent school relations, oh, she brought the house down. Because she really was the mother to them all. And I remember there are 800 kids, it's not a small school. But you could come to her if you couldn't afford a winter coat. She figure out a way to find a winter coat for your kid. You could come to her if she might be able to know who, who to call to get on the waiting list for public housing. And she, Maria, would, Maria Kanek, would call parents if their kid was late one day. What's going on? Uh, the kid is, is absent? Absolutely. Phone calls, connections, whatever. And when 
after that big meeting, parents went to their teacher, the, the teachers of their kids, and you heard a lot of just what you were describing. Professora, you're doing wonderful. No, I can't do this on my own. If we're not partners, I'm going to fail. So you have to sign off every day that la tarea, the homework, is done. And they actually started figuring, when can you actually you know, listen to your child read? Well, you know, mom's working piecemeal here or there. And they worked out a half an hour block. When the child was picked up by mom, they went on the bus together, dropped the child off at home, and then mom went off to work. That was the time that they could spend their lives. One by one, very individualized strategy being built. A lot easier, as you know, preschool, you're going to get lots more parents involved. Elementary school begins to fall off in middle school. High school, any place. You know, is my kid in trouble? Then why are you calling? <laughs> uh, but that's, that's the way that is. But, it, you know, again, this, did, this was not something that happened overnight. This was a Cuban town. This was the second largest concentration of Cubans in America after Miami. This was Havana on the Hudson. And these, that population, middle class professional folks fleeing from Castro, um, you had a district that hadn't accommodated itself to that reality. As soon as they could get out of that system, they started going to the parochial schools. So enrollment started declining. Now, two of the parochial schools in town closed because these parents, and this next generation of parents um, think that their kids are doing better um, in the public school. In the public schools, it takes time, but you know. Maybe one, one more question. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for your remarks. I recently read a study that talked about. Um, it was based in California. It talked about African American students were four times more likely to be absent. I mean, the big major factors were poverty and disciplinary structures. So I'm hearing, you know, your insights about these spaces that students can richly benefit from, but what about those inequitable structures that keep them out of the classroom? Like how can those be addressed based on your insights? Well, I'm going to give you a part answer to that, to that question and come back to it here. I was asked at one point a book about African-American male youth, because the boy story is a whole lot different from the girl story that you're that you're, that you're describing. That's really where the biggest concern is. So I was asked, so what do we know that works for African American boys? What kinds of programs do they do better than you'd expect them to? You start with preschool and Head Start and the class size reduction programs and you work your way up the ladder to things, that, the kind of programs I was describing. You know, the, the uh, program in which you get mentors in the schools kind of palling with kids. You get them connected to things like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or the variants of those organizations in the inner cities. And I looked at this array of programs, and what I did was ask the researchers. I, there was no data that I could find that looked at just isolated African-American boys as opposed to girls. It was all African-American, Latino, et cetera, or boys and girls. So I had them run the data on the successful programs. And lo and behold, the ones that really made a difference were the ones in which close attention, individual attention, was paid. And my favorite example <coughs> is that reading and math program that I described, where the teachers follow the kids. Well, after any program like that, you're going to get fade out over time. Right? They're going to lose some of the boost that they got, some of it. The African-American girls didn't lose a lot. The African American boys lost a ton, suggesting something about what the schools needed to provide to them. So, you know, that's what I would, you know, the other thing I would say is part of the mantra of the quote reformers is no excuses. I mean, that's, you know, just listen to, as if poverty were an excuse. So if you're there in this model, and you know, this is something that the best of the charter school folks have been learning, and that's what I'm, I've, I've been just, again, I'm in the middle of reading how to teach, and I'm getting a feel for what that's like. If that's your mindset, that you're there to teach reading and math, and you're, by God, you're going to drill it into them. If that kid 
in this charter school, forgot his belt um, and his school uniform, home he goes, okay. um, it's not going to work. Uh, it's not going to work. So that's at least the best I can do for now. And I'm happy to stick around if the room is stick around and we'll talk. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.